Cheap phones rule at Mobile World Congress. We get serious about Apple Watch rumors and new details on how the nation's air traffic control system might be vulnerable to hackers. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 286 for Tuesday, March 3rd, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash T-N-2. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get started on the tech news of the day. This week, Twit News Director Mike Elgin is in Barcelona for the Mobile World Congress. He's seen some amazing new technology, everything from cars that talk to each other about dangerous road conditions to the world's thinnest smartphones. The big trend at the show are cheaper cheaper phones that are in the $1 to $200 range, for those that aren't trying to compete with Apple and Samsung. There are, of course, lots and lots of wearables and a BlackBerry phone with no keyboard. We'll have live coverage from Barcelona with Mike Elgin throughout the evening and then tomorrow morning starting at 6 a.m. Pacific. Though the Apple Watch is not expected to be available until April on March 9th, Apple will hold an event where we expect to hear more details. Joining us to talk about some of these rumors and some news that might even back those rumors up is Jason Snell of Six Colors and the Incomparable Podcast. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for having me. So the rumor is that next week we'll get a ship date and possibly pricing. How do we know this and do you believe this rumor? I think uh, it's been going to be six months to the day since Apple announced the Apple Watch when uh, Monday rolls around. And uh, we've had six months of fevered, semi-informed speculation about it. And I think this is a chance for Apple to reset. This is going to be the chance. There may be other stuff that they announce, although I kind of doubt there will be much more than the Apple Watch. This is Apple's chance to put its best foot forward. It knows a lot more about exactly what is in the watch now. It's going to have developers who can talk about third-party apps that are running on the watch. It can be clearer about pricing and availability. So, you know, six months ago, it wasn't done. <laughs> and now it's very close to being done. So I think now we're going to get a lot of detail that Apple just couldn't have given us before. So we know the price of the sport watch, but do you have any guesses on prices of the other the other versions of the watch? Every time I make a guess, I, uh, I then think it's too low. So I'm going to say that again, which is, you know, I, I want to say like seven or $800 for the Apple Watch without a name. Uh, and then the Apple Watch Edition, you know, that's going to be a five or what what a uh, six figure i don't know seven it's going to be like 10 grand 20 grand it's because gold watches are super expensive and they won't sell any very many of them but the the stainless steel model is the question mark is that is that in the 500 hundred dollar range or is that more in the thousand dollar range is everybody who is price conscious buying uh the apple watch sport which is the one that's going to start at 350 um, and how high up is that uh, next model going to be that's the i think that's a, a a big mystery it really depends on how apple wants to spin all of this and i hope that we'll get that cleared up on monday Right. And then there's the issue of the bands, like, will they charge more for different bands? And there was a lot of, you know, just, well, it's the same as cases. Like, you know, you have to get this special case and that's going to cost more. And yeah, so I guess we could we could spend all day talking about uh -huh. that. <laughs> we, we could. And, and the bands, I think the bands are a huge complication. I think that is going to lead to a lot of the pricing variability is going to be based on what band you're using. Are you using, uh, you know, a simple leather band or is this super fancy uh, metal loop band, and those are going to be hundreds of dollars too. So I think the base, what we know is that the smaller sport model with the rubber uh, band basically is going to be 349 and the sky's the limit for the other end of it. Right. So another thing people have been talking about a lot is what's it going to be for? Why do I need it? I don't, I, 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 I don't want it unless I know why, why I'm going to need it. And uh, so a lot of we can tell is by the apps that they're creating. So there's a website, Watch Aware, that I saw on 9to5Mac that, that shows the apps as they're added. Have you taken a look at any of these? Yeah, well, so all of them are pretty simple and that is to be expected because what we're talking about here, app developers are only going to be able to do, they're essentially projecting some images onto the watch screen from their 
from the, their iPhone app. So in fact, you won't be able as a developer to write software that runs on the watch for a while. Maybe, I think Apple said last year that it would be sort of the end of 2015 when that might happen. So they're all pretty simple remote controls for things, uh, quick glances at stuff that's happening on the internet or on apps that are running on your phone. It really is all about tying to the iPhone. The iPhone, this is, a, this is an iPhone accessory. This is getting a lot of the intelligence and a lot of the data that's happening on the internet and on your iPhone in uh, up to your wrist where you can glance at it briefly, be notified that something is going on, and then either decide to act quickly to respond or say, okay, I'm going to take out my phone and do some you know, more serious work. It is, it is in that you know, in-between space where notifications and quick reminders live, but not uh, super detailed uh, amounts of work. Because I think, I think the watch will be a failure if people are hunched over their wrists um, trying to to dictate memos all the time. I, it, it's not meant to be used like that, I think. Well, it's interesting because that's the way email was. I you remember like 10 or 15 years ago, it was like, oh, well, I can check email on my phone, but I would never respond to an email using my phone. Right. You know, So I wonder if they'll just, it'll evolve in a way that we'll be doing everything on the tiny little screen. <laughs> Well, the text-to-speech stuff, I mean, Siri is going to be on there. Um, you, you should be able to respond with uh, text to, with speech-to-text, right? So, so you would be able to probably do a pretty quick response. I just think that um, I, I don't think people are going to accept at this point a watch that is essentially a phone. Uh, I think it's going to be a while, if ever. Um, and if we do get it, I think it's going to be much more likely that it is voice controlled than it's something where we're doing a lot of uh, tapping. Uh, you know, if, if famously Steve Jobs said that if you see a stylus with a tablet, they blew it. I think if you ever see a keyboard or other kind of like letter by letter data entry on a watch, they blew it. I, I don't think anybody wants to do that. So the tech stuff, being able to use your voice to control it, um, that's going to be a big... Uh, productivity boost for it. If you're going to be productive on something like this, it's going to have to be a super simple input method like your voice. Right. So earlier on MacBreak Weekly, uh, Leo showed this uh, site on 9to5Mac. Uh, it was a list of selling strategies for Apple employees. It basically said, we know people are going to come in already wanting the watch. Um, you need to just show them which one they want. I guess it was kind of like he didn't, you know, he, they don't want people trying to upsell everyone because that that's you know, offensive. But uh so, so what do you think about these questions um, that they're suggesting Apple employees ask as people are buying the watch? I, I have to say, when I first saw this, I thought this kind of takes the magic out of the Apple store a little bit where it's like, oh, you know, they're going to have a script and all that. But you've got to train your people, right? And and I, in fact, I think most badly, um, most bad Apple store experiences and maybe most bad retail experiences in general are when people have no idea what they're supposed to say. They're going off the script. They're making stuff up because mm -hmm. then you get an inconsistent experience. And Apple wants this experience to be consistent. It is a a new step for them to sell this product. And I think uh, it's sort of fascinating to see how they want to train their employees to approach it. And soft sell is good, not uh, trying to be like really super cheesy salesperson trying to have, what, what, what's it going to take for me to get you in this watch today, right? <laughs> That's not going to work. Um, and the initial buyers for this thing are going to be dedicated iPhone fans. I think that's, I mean, it is an iPhone accessory. It requires the iPhone. So, you know, you're selling to people who've already spent a lot of money on Apple products and asking them to uh, buy another product that's going to hopefully enhance the, the iPhone experience they've already got. And so it's good advice, uh, but it is weird to see it put down in memo form because it doesn't, I don't know, sales strategy like this, it doesn't feel very Apple-like, but it is what you have to do. You've got a giant staff of retail employees. You need to train them. Uh, but it does take away a little bit of the magic when when suddenly the Apple Watch is this interesting gadget has been reduced to a bunch of uh, bullet points in the sales slide. Right. I mean, it's, you know, we we hear all these rumors and we always kind of wonder, did, did Apple leak it on purpose? But I'm guessing that they did not leak their sales strategy on purpose. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think this Mark Ehrman has very good uh, moles inside Apple retail who, and once it's rolled out to the sales staff, I mean, one salesperson uh, is all it takes for that stuff to get out. And that's what, ha it's happened before and it has happened again. Right. So speaking of Mark Gurman, he also has some more rumors uh, about 
uh, star, the iPhone and the Apple Watch being able to open Starwood hotel room doors. Now, is that like any hotel room door? That's what we get if we pay $20,000 for a watch. We can just open any hotel room door. How's that going to work? <laughs> That's right. It's a it's a very strange perk of the Apple Watch edition. If you can afford $20,000 for a watch, it'll open any door, <laughs> anywhere. Um, I, uh, Tim Cook said something about opening your car door with the Apple Watch, too. I think what's happening here is, look, the, they, they've got NFC, um, radios in the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus and in the Apple Watch. And they're going to, they're right now only used for Apple Pay. And anybody who's used any Android phones knows that that stuff can be used for all sorts of different wireless communication. So it sounds to me like Apple is going to use that for a few other applications pretty soon. And one of them is probably going to be this, uh, the hotel room thing. They mentioned that, I think, in September. And the car door thing, too. I think four compatible. You know, compatible hardware with partners, they'll make that they'll make that work. And I assume it'll work a little bit like Apple Pay, where as long as you keep the watch on, you're sort of authenticated, and you can just tap your watch anywhere, and and, and it'll work. When you take it off, it it basically deauthenticates, and then you've got to prove who you are again before. So if you if you take your watch off and somebody walks off with it, they actually can't use Apple Pay. They can't open up your hotel room door, which is is something. But <laughs> this would be the first signs outside of Apple Pay that. They've been using the NFC uh, chips to do some other stuff. Well, that makes sense. I mean, you know, the door keys are basically like credit cards. It doesn't seem... Yeah, like it's a card reader already. So, uh, you know, and maybe it, what's in it for Starwood is, uh, you know, it's an added selling point. It's like uh, people who've got Apple Pay and they can choose between Walgreens and CVS and one of them has Apple Pay. Maybe they go to Walgreens because, you know, they can just use their phone to pay there. And and maybe they'll reserve at a Starwood hotel because... Those, that, those chains have uh, have the magic door technology so that you can just open your door with your Apple Watch. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see whether that's something that's actually practical or just, uh, you know, a, again, a bullet point that is just a sort of like, look, well, look what you can do, but nobody actually does it. All right. So now you've been an Apple journalist for a long time. So you've you've faced this these kinds of rumors before, these kinds of launches that you're know, highly anticipated. So what rumors in the past have you gotten right and which ones have you gotten terribly, horribly, awfully wrong? I have to say, as somebody who covers Apple, I've always been very focused on what happens um, when the product is released. And I, I I have not ever been one of those people who's got a lot of inside sources who tell me secret things that I then report on. Or the other kind of rumors journalist who are the people who don't have any sources and they just make things up. Uh, Mark Gurman's a great example of the former of those. He has fantastic sources. He's usually right. And then there's a lot of stuff in the latter camp. So I don't know. I mean, I, the things that come to mind for me are more about predictions that I made that, that were right or not right. My favorite is probably the um, the uh, iPad when it launched. I said... I said, I don't know if it's going to sell a million or five million in, in, in its first year. And it sold more than 10 million in its first year. I thought the upper bound, the crazy upper limit of the iPad uh, was like five million. And I was not even close to what the actual number was. So that's one of my favorite failed predictions. But we've all got them. I honestly, I predicted that Apple wouldn't do an event just to launch the Apple Watch. And I appear to have gotten that completely wrong. So, you know, you, people, you come on shows like this and people ask you to make uh, pronouncements and sometimes uh, it's always fun and sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong. Um, you know, I, I think it's a really interesting question whether this is going to be 100% Apple Watch or whether they will drop some other products in here. My, my gut feeling is if they're going to do this event now, time the way it is, that it will be almost 100% Apple Watch. This is the big push. Uh, but we'll see on Monday. Right. So the Pebble Steel was also released today, uh, and the, it's kind of a bit of an upsell for their uh -huh. old, um, for the, the watch that old, I say, it was a week ago well, that they right. released. Uh, how do you think that'll compare to the Apple Watch? Well, I mean, the, if you look at the styling on the Pebble Time Steel versus the Pebble Time, which they unveiled on Kickstarter last week, uh, lots of Kickstarter craziness going on with the people at Pebble. Um, it is... There's one version of it that is shot to look exactly like the Apple Watch. The problem is that the bezel is huge because the screen is really tiny and it's this little, it's not black and white anymore, but it's a little LCD screen compared to the super high resolution touch screen that's in the Apple Watch. So, you know, those watches are nice. I actually prefer the the regular Pebble to the Pebble Steel um, because the Pebble Steel felt... Um, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't like the way the metal was worked. I didn't think it, it felt kind of lousy. Um, I would imagine they've learned a lot from that, and that maybe the new Pebble Steel Time 
uh, will be better. It certainly looks a lot better than the, the old model does. And then the regular Pebble, you know, is plasticky and swatch-like, and that's okay, too. I've, I've got one of those right now. So, uh, but yeah, you can see it looks fancy. It looks very much like an Apple Watch and good for them for, for doing that. But, you know, it's not made of gold. It's just gold colored and it's still got that low resolution screen. But as a low, co low cost smartwatch, uh, Pebble has an interesting market. The problem is that um, they're more and more featured, uh, focused on Android features because iOS is just not going to be that open to them because Apple's putting all of their strength behind the Apple Watch. And so it's becoming an increasingly good um, Android watch, but not really an increasingly good iPhone accessory. And as an iPhone user, that means that I'm not really that interested in buying another Pebble. But I think as a as a low-end, uh, long battery life Android accessory, it's actually really promising. So their selling point that it, it'll work with iOS and Android is kind of not exactly accurate. It's hard for them to work with iOS. They do, but ha as somebody who has a Pebble right now on my wrist and has been using it for two years, it kind of works. Sometimes it stops. It loses track. Notification center isn't very good at sending. I mean, Apple's not been motivated to make this work great with the Pebble because all the people at Apple have been working on this Apple Watch. And, you know, that's their prerogative. Uh, and so instead, Pebble is adding features. Like when they announced that the new Pebble Time has a uh, has a microphone on it, that's great. It works with Android and it works with like one app on iOS right now because it has to be a special custom thing in order to make it work with iOS. And maybe they'll improve it over time. I just, my gut feeling is it's never going to be a great iPhone accessory and it's going to increasingly be adding features that are good Android features. And so, you know, over time, I think it's going to be really tough for anybody to make a smartwatch that works with iOS uh, that can compete with the Apple Watch because Apple, it's Apple's game. They own the game. They're not just making an Apple Watch. They're updating iOS to work great with the Apple Watch. And, you, you know, you can't, you can't beat that if you're Pebble. Right. Well, I asked our audience to send me emails about their Apple Watch hopes and fears and predictions. And I'll just read a few. Ben writes that he wants to, it to charge fast, like when he's in the shower, because he wants to wear it all the time. And uh, what if you could wear it and charge it while you're sleeping? Um, ben also says he's tired of waiting. So yeah, what, if you are supposed to wear it all the time, what, I mean, have they said how long it takes Apple to charge? Says, Apple said at their last event that you charge it overnight. So this implication is you can wear it all day, but at the end of the day, they want you to charge it overnight. So I think if if uh, if Ben wants to sleep with it, he may not get his chance with this first generation. I never have slept with a watch on. I always take it off, and um, and so for me, it works fine with that approach. That you you know you as you're going to bed, you 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 take the watch off and click it on. It's a little magnetic charger, and then in the morning, it's it's up and running. It's, I, it sounds to me like that's what they're. That's what their model is. That's what they're planning is. You should be able to get up, get you know, take a shower, um, step out of the shower, put on your Apple Watch, wear it all day, and then take it back off when you go to bed. And uh, and it should survive. We'll see if they can make that goal, but I'm sure that that is their goal. So it won't have the Fitbit-like features that track you when you're sleeping. And I'm sure they want to do that, but you got to charge it sometime. And I think nighttime is the most realistic time to to charge it. Yeah, fast charge would be great. Charge it while you're in the shower. But I, I don't think they're going to be able to do that either with yeah. this generation. Uh, and uh, another audience member, Gardner, says it's unlikely that he will be purchasing an Apple Watch unless he sees a developer angle on it, in which case he'll expense it and write some software. Uh -huh. Well, there is a developer angle now with WatchKit, like I said earlier. Um, right now, it's sort of a uh, remote control for your iPhone app. So developers are writing, like Marco Arment has a podcast app, uh, Overcast, and he's writing a remote control for Overcast. So you can see what's playing and you can say next or previous or pick something else. And it's very simple. There are going to be a lot of things like that. And then by the end of the year, they said at the last event, developers will be able to write code that actually runs on the watch. It'll probably have some limitations, but watch apps will happen. Presumably custom watch faces will happen at some point. So I think Gardner will get his chance to uh, to buy an Apple Watch and expense it at some point. The question is, uh, if, if Gardner doesn't have any I, iOS apps right now, uh, then it's worth waiting until the point where you can just write watch apps and have them run right on the device. Good point. And now Thomas writes that he wants it to stream live video of his cat while he's at work. And he was also like a feature that when the button is pressed on the side of the watch, it dispenses catnip at home to his cat. And while I love these ideas, I'm not sure why the watch would be at home. I think the uh, idea yeah. is that 
You're there wearing- is an app for that. There is an app for that, and there is a there is there's some uh, crazy thing that lets you like feed your cat and play with your cat and stuff using an app on your iPhone. But you, the watch, the watch is an accessory. I'm going to actually answer this question seriously. The watch okay, is good. an accessory for your iPhone, so you bring it with you. It doesn't do very much without your iPhone. So, and it's not on the internet. It's got Wi-Fi in it, but it's really meant to talk to your phone. So, what you do is you'd have a an amazing catnip dispensing device at home. And then you'd have the app running on your iPhone that connects with it. And maybe it's got an extension that lets you check in on your watch to what's happening back at home. That's how that would work. Okay. Now, as long as I have you here, the other big Apple news today was the freak security flaw in OS X. Uh, what can you tell us about this? It's uh, so it's it's a weird flaw that's in it's in Chrome and Firefox too. I think it, it, it's everywhere, but. Um, it dates back to the 90s. In fact, I saw somebody today, a security expert, who said this is essentially a zombie from the 90s that nobody managed to kill or we forgot. And so it's just kind of wandered around. And it all goes back to this idea of uh, not being able to export uh, encryption because it was considered munitions, which is something that went away, I think, maybe in the Clinton administration at some point. But there is still this mode that is this low security mode that is of, in some browsers. And if you're in low security mode, um, somebody can crack the, the I think, 512-bit security um, in, you know, the, the encryption keys. So, People don't use that anymore. It's now legal to have bigger encryption keys. It's been legal for like 15 years to have those encryption keys. Unfortunately, this is the zombie has stayed like around and it's an exploit. So it sounds like uh, everybody is going to be fixing it. Uh, Google rolled out a fix because it affects Android uh, browsers and it's rolled out a fix to their partners. Now the partners have to roll it out. Apple said that they would have something, I think, next week on it. Um, it's not a super in the realm of super scary security holes. This is not a horrible one, but it is a reminder that, you know, the the sins of the past will sometimes come back to haunt us. And this is an example of this misguided idea of having, um, saving the United States by making it uh, illegal to have good security ends up being something that bites everybody. Um, and it's something to keep in mind that the next time somebody says, let's put back doors in security software so that our government can peek in the back doors, what they're really doing is opening a Pandora's box. And then at some point later, somebody else will also figure out the back doors. That's essentially, you know, what's happened here. An old policy that was probably a bad idea is coming back to bite us uh, more than 15 years later. Well, hopefully we can learn from our mistakes in the future. Yeah, we'll do that update. Everybody do that update next week and then we'll all be okay. Okay. Well, Jason Snell, thank you so much. And you're the editor at Six Colors and the host of the Incomparable podcast. Uh, what else are you working on? Uh, I also have a couple of podcasts at uh, Relay FM. Uh, so you can check those out too. I'm podcasting everywhere. I'm writing uh, monthly for imore.com. And it looks like I'm going to be writing some things for my old stomping grounds at Macworld starting soon as well. So I'm, I'm freelancing all over the place and then doing lots of podcasting. Busy. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks. And coming up, one Google exec jumps ship for Oculus Rift and find out what emoji Apple forgot to include in its next update. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to learn PHP, improve your communication skills, develop an app, or master PowerPoint. Lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. Some of the courses I recommend are Going Paperless, Start to Finish, Income Tax Fundamentals, useful at this time of year. I promised my tax person that I would uh, send her my stuff, and I'm not, so I might have to do it myself. Going to learn on Lynda.com. And also the weekly Office Workshop Series which gives you quick weekly tips that you can use immediately to increase your proficiency in Excel, Word, Outlook, and more. With a lynda.com membership, you can stream thousands of courses on demand and learn at your own pace on your schedule. Courses are structured so you can watch them from start to finish or consume them in bite-sized pieces. It's your call. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2, and we thank them for their support. 
Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Facebook's Oculus Rift virtual reality team has just hired computer scientist Mary Lou Jepsen, although they have yet to say what her new role at Oculus will be. Jepsen was formerly the head of the display division at Google X. She also started the One Laptop Per Child nonprofit with Nicholas Negroponte 10 years ago. If you want to learn more about Jepsen, check out her excellent TED Talk on how future devices might be able to read images from our brains. Red Sox pitcher Kurt Schilling pulled a fast one on Twitter trolls, not just by fighting back with angry tweets, which he did, but also by revealing that Twitter isn't quite as anonymous as it seems. Mashable reports that last week Schilling tweeted about his 17-year-old daughter's acceptance into a, a softball program, and he received sexually explicit and abusive tweets with rape references. In response, Schilling was able to out the worst offenders, which resulted in as many as nine trolls losing their jobs or getting kicked off sports teams and getting kicked out of school. The FAA administration said that you, an FAA administrator said that U.S. air traffic control system is safe, that's despite a government accountability report saying that it is vulnerable to hackers. Although most of the report findings are classified, NPR said today that weaknesses were found in the way air, air traffic controls uh, encrypt sensitive data, prevent and detect unauthorized access to computer resources, and the way the system identifies and authenticates users. And finally, I firmly believe that emojis have the power to change the world, and not just because it's so fun to say the word emoji, We've talked a lot about how the newest iOS and OS 10 update will feature new, more diverse emojis. Now the website Ginger Parrot is asking the question, and rightfully so, why is there no red-headed emoji? If you feel that this is a travesty, as I do, then go sign the petition at change.org because change, friends, starts with you and with red-headed emojis. If you feel disenfranchised by the lack of an emoji that represents you, please email to tell me all about it at megan at twit.tv, and I'll see what I can do. And one more thing, my producer Jason says that while there is a fight to have emojis look like real life, we should never forget what real life emojis look like. If you ever saw that, you won't forget. That's not something that you can unsee. <laughs> And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv or Megan at twit.tv. And watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today. I'll be hosting it for Mike for the next three days. It's every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.